everybody doing? Can you all hear me loud and clear? And it's the number one question. I have a few. Okay, good. Thank you, Denise. Looks like it. Just trying to get some things arranged here, having a little glitches. So bear with me just a second. Uh, what am I missing here? There's a piece that I normally have here that I can't see. Oh, <laughs> somebody's got puts, huh, Tom? <laughs> Where is what I'm looking for? I don't know. I don't know where it went. Oh well. Uh, I'm not going to. Usually, what usually I've got something a, a screen here where I can see what can be seen, but for some reason it's gone. So I'm not going to worry about it. So I'm assuming y'all can see the market mashup. <clears throat> so welcome out. And uh, okay, good. Um, yeah, there's a, usually a thing in here where I can, it'll show me exactly what's on the screen so I know what you guys are looking at, what you can see, and it allows me to know um, exactly what's going on, but I'm not seeing it here for some reason. So I don't know what happened if they pulled that out or, oh, there we go. There we go. It somehow got dischecked. More of those technical glitches. I love them. So anyway, let's get right to it. So welcome out to the market mashup. If you haven't been here, if you have, then you know what this is all about, and uh, we're really here to have some some fun, do a little learning, and see what's happening. So, but let's get the legal stuff out of the way. We're not registered broker dealers, investment advisors. Everything we do here is purely educational. I will not give any recommendations or advice. If we're talking about trading, and I forget to say paper trade, practice trade, unfunded trade, then assume that it is for regulatory reasons. We do not discuss funded trades here. Everything we discuss is uh, paper or practice. Uh, but like I say many times, and the reality is we should practice as if it's for real, right? And I, I treat all my trades the same, whether it's funded or unfunded. So, But if you aren't new to it, there is the agenda for the next uh, 45 minutes or hour. And I know some of you are saying, well, there's nothing on my screen. That's the agenda. <laughs> And like I say, I'll, every week, it's, that's, this is what I think has made it fun, at least for me it has, because it's we have a blank slate. We can do whatever we want, talk about whatever we want. We can address whatever questions, issues you guys have, anything you want to talk about, strategy, technical analysis, mindset. And really the two things that I'm passionate about are technical analysis and mindset, which are basically one and the same. One's a visual representation of the underlying emotion of the market. So... Um, <laughs> But strategy, options, all that stuff, I'm very familiar with. Obviously, I mean, it's been, well, April will be 16 years since I first started um, learning about and trading the market. So um, I've been doing it for a little while. Um, but let's take a peek. The We'll go here. Um, market's getting trashed again, no surprise. Um, that's not right. That's need, I didn't want that there, but that's okay. So uh, obviously getting beat up big time, and uh, I was kind of hoping, waiting for a bounce a little bit, and that's the hard part is seeing it drop even more. I know obviously some of you are <laughs> inputs. <coughs> I had uh, so I'm. Uh, it's kind of hard for me at least to pull the trigger now on puts when it's dropping and it's dropped as far as it has because the further it drops and this is the hard part and this is what's one of the things that's challenging especially in times like right now where we've dropped so far so fast that the odds of a bounce are increasing with every single drop that we have and so it gets to a point where it's like where do you pull the trigger and get in because if you get in now on the put side the odds are high enough that things will probably bounce and have a retracement to the upside that you're going to get hammered pretty bad. If you got inputs right now, let's say, I mean, you can see the market's down, what, 50 points, I think it was? Cool, here. Yeah, S&P's down 50, basically. 
400 points on the Dow, which you don't really look at. NASDAQ's down 125. I mean, it's getting hammered. And we have officially broken that 1860 area. Drag these down here, which is the longer term. <coughs> kind of what I was expecting, but there's nothing. Um, if we come over here, I've got I think more stuff drawn on here. Yeah. We'll look at the S&P. Um, let me do a quick intraday update here. So we'll get at least close to the time that we have now. Yeah, you get in a whips on eating up. It's a perfect way to describe it. <laughs> um, but that's the hard part. You know, and getting to the, the mental side of it is you don't want to miss the drop, especially if this thing's going to continue to fall. And, and this is where I'm at. And this isn't, I mean, I'm at a point right now where I look at this and go, man, if this thing just keeps on tanking, I want it. I want to be in there. But if you get in right now, you're not only going to pay an inflated price for the puts, because I'm going to guess the VIX is up significantly. Yeah, so you were at 30 on the VIX, and the VIX is climbing steadily. It's not one of these blast-off things. So volatility is increasing. So the price of the options are going up, because that's the way the model works. The higher the volatility goes, the more time premium they put into them. So you're going to pay more for the puts. And then if it bounces, which... It doesn't fall like this very often. You can see what happened last time, and back in it was August, September. I mean, that's a five-day drop. Here we're on a two-and-a-half-week drop, which is just a steady sell-off. So it is different, but at the same time, when does it bounce? And when it does, as you can see here, we hit, what, 1867 and bounced up to 2,000. We had 100-some points. So if you get in the puts right now and it bounces – you're going to be underwater, and the only way to come out of it is to hang on long enough to have it drop back if, keyword being if, it drops back. And so this is, as hard as it is, and I'm talking to myself more than anybody, as hard as it is to sit here and watch this, if you're in a position already, you're feeling awesome. Just ask Tom. <laughs> but he's got better, outstanding and getting better in caps. And I'm only assuming, I don't know this for sure, and he hasn't said, and I don't want him necessarily to confirm it, but I'm assuming he's in puts. And so the further this thing falls, the more he's making. <coughs> I've been there before. And I did get out expecting it to bounce pretty decent and hasn't bounced the way I expected it to. But also know that once it breaks this level, which it's doing right now, then there's another opportunity to get in. I was kind of hoping this thing would bounce along, either bounce along the 1875 a little bit longer you know, a few more doji days, or have a pretty good retracement back to the upside to give an opportunity to get it. But it's not doing that right now. It's breaking down. Um, so really, I'm just sitting and going to wait for this thing. And that's the hard part. It's sitting waiting for it to bounce. But the odds are that it's going to bounce back up, and we'll probably come back up and test that 1867 area, at least somewhere in there, probably 1850, between 1850 and 1870. And so as hard as it is to sit and watch this fall and not get in, I have to force myself to and wait for it to bounce back up. So <laughs> it is, for those of you that maybe are not in and you're sitting here going, oh, I need to be in puts, I should be in puts, and you're freaking out and you're tempted and want to pull the trigger, and it's not necessarily bad. Because this thing could very well just keep falling. So one potential thing you could do, which I'll talk about is scaling, is you know if you really think it's going to continue to drop, which it very well could, then this might be a place to jump on a small position. Honestly, I'm starting to think maybe that's what I should do, is just take a little position, because if it continues to fall, then you continue to make money. But if it doesn't and it bounces and you only have a small position, then it's not as painful. Or if you take a small enough position where you can put the stop far enough back that it doesn't whipsaw you out, then that may be a potential solution. See, and that's the thing is right now 
looking at this, seeing how far it's fallen, how quickly it's fallen, and wanting to get in puts or load up on more puts, that's the temptation. But the fear is the bounce back. And so how do you deal with that? And that really is what trading comes down to, is dealing with emotions. Learning to manage our emotions and handle them in a way where we can make solid decisions and not do something and then go, wow, what did I do that for? Anybody ever done that? <laughs> you make a decision, you pull the trigger either to get in or get out of something, and not more than five seconds go by, and you go, oh, I should have stayed in. Oh, what did I do that for? Why did I do that? We've all been there, right? And so right now is one of those moments where I love this, I love the look, I love the fact that it's breaking the 1867 because I've been expecting this for a while. Am I a little cranky? I'm not more loaded up on the downside? Yeah. And do I feel like I'm missing something? Yeah. Is it frustrating to be watching this thing tank and not have the puts that I did have? not have the positions that I had that I've, I've cleared out of some of them, maybe waited too long to get back in. Yeah, it's frustrating. But here's the beauty. If we look at this picture right here, and we take the 2000 crash and the 08 crash, And we look at them, relatively speaking, we say we went from 15.50 to, well, one times 7.50, one times 6.75. Excuse me. Basically, we got cut in half. So if we have a 50% retracement, which is entirely possible, we're looking to come in all the way down to about 1,000, which is where? Let's call it 10.50. That would be exactly about close enough. We're looking at a retracement to about that level. Now, generally speaking, these type of sell-offs, these type of downtrends don't necessarily, they happen, they can happen quickly. You look at, see the 07 away. I mean, we're talking, well, the, it peaked out in October of 07 and it bottomed March of 09. What's that, 18 months, basically? 15, 18 months. The 2000 crash was um, actually less severe. I mean, it, it was about the same drop, about, got cut in half, yeah, a little more than in half in 08. But I think we could be headed for something more like the 2000 drop. Unless, you know, if there's, if there's, the 08 was, and you see that huge acceleration of the downside, I mean, the economy was on the brink of collapse because of the um, housing crisis and what happened. You know the financial the financial issues. Which, if we had something like that again, very well could do exactly that right there. It could be even worse, actually. There may be things in place that will not allow that to happen. I, you know, it's hard to say. I mean, back in '07, people thought that. It's funny because. It was on a little Facebook debate <laughs> the other day, and it was funny because the guy responds to something that I had posted about, uh, well, it was a Bernie Sanders thing, and he's like, really? I mean, the economy's better, and this and that, and, 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 and really? And then it's funny because a couple of days later, there's a quote that Bernie Sanders posted on his page. I don't remember. I don't know how I get it. It shows up on there. Maybe somebody posted Whatever. But the last paragraph of this three-paragraph thing that he talked about, that he was going on about what he's going to do, the last paragraph was, you know, unemployments are at record highs and this and that, and talking about how terrible the economy is. <laughs> this is <laughs> – and I'm just laughing because this guy's talking about how great the economy is, and it's so wonderful. And I'm like, this is the guy you're rooting for, and he's talking about how terrible the economy is. I just I just thought it was funny. It was just it was just kind of cracking up. I don't know how I got off on that. Found that squirrel, but um, if it's if it's if the economy is not that great, oh, 
there could be if there's any kind of major glitch in the system like the housing crisis um, there's lots of different things that probably could happen that would create that type of scenario again you know we're what are we 20 trillion dollars in debt now if we're not we will be in the next couple of days probably right it was 19 last time I saw <coughs> and it's going up by what 500 600 million a day it's just insanity um, financially things don't look pretty um, so that's why I've been saying for I mean I've been talking about it for well over a year now as this market has taken off and run that be prepared because this thing's not going to run forever and it's very reminiscent of oops wrong way you look at the 2000 rally you know back in 95 90 91 94 basically 95 it started if you go back to this point right here 95 up to 2000 you got about a five year period where we went from 450 to 1500 so we tripled events essentially and here we've gone you know bottom of 09 was basically 700 to 2100 we tripled in about the same time frame hmm and not only that but the ascent is very similar you look at how steep it is and that's the reality is you look back here and this is something that you'll read in, in any decent technical analysis book they say this right here this is typical growth this is a normal natural trend that is about a 45 degree angle that's essentially the standard if you will this type of acceleration 300 percent in five years not normal and by any normal standard is not sustainable yet what have we had since 09 is six or seven years we've tripled hmm. now I know for those of you that might be new out here and I do see a, a name or two that's uh, familiar which I always like to see or not new I should say not familiar um, some people say well you're being pessimistic you're being a pessimist I know I hate to beat this drum again but at the same time it's important to address because <laughs> the reality is let's put it this way as traders and knowing how to take advantage of a downward move if you could have bought puts and traded the downside during 07 08 crash and the 2000 crash would your account have gone up in value yeah even if you just bought leap puts and just hung on for a year and a half you would have made a fortune or if you would have seen it clearly and been prepared for it and been able to take advantage of it even if you didn't have long and you just said okay we're in a downtrend this thing is headed down I'm gonna focus on buying puts and do bearish strategies because the market itself is bearish. You make a ton of money. Now, I don't know if that's a pessimistic point of view or if it's optimistic because I don't know about you guys, but I feel pretty good when my account's going up in value when the market's dropping. No problem whatsoever with that. <coughs> and like I've said many times, and I'm not going to go down the whole road, but because I did this live, I don't know, probably six months ago, the gentleman called me out right there in front of class. I said, you're being a pessimist. Okay, so let's say that you take your skill and knowledge and your ability to make money when the market drops. And let's say in the next one to two years, you make an additional $100,000 playing the downside. Is that going to help you? Yes. Can you now make sure that you are able to support yourself? Let's say you lose your job and you can't work, but you can make enough money in the market to support yourself and pay your bills. Have you just helped out? society in general if you will yeah because you don't have to get on any kind of assistance you don't have to take money or beg for it you don't have to do anything from anybody else you are sustaining yourself number one goal right but let's say you make enough to do more than sustain yourself and let's say the economy is terrible and maybe a family member or a friend is in trouble financially and you have enough you have excess money because you're trading the downside of the market and you know how to take advantage of it. Can you now maybe help them out? Maybe a family member or friend is, is in jeopardy of losing their house and an extra five grand would, would save them for six months to a year until they can maybe get back on their feet. 
And you say, wow, I've got an extra $100,000 sitting in my account. You know what? I can give you $5,000 because I'll just buy some puts, and in the next week or two, I'll make the five grand back, so I'm not worried about it. That doesn't sound very pessimistic to me. So I just kind of chuckle when I hear people say that because they just it, it just it just shows that they don't I don't know how to say it. It's like they got the wool over their eyes. It's like you, you want to pretend that we live in this world where everything is constantly always getting better, everything's so rosy and the economy is getting one and all that stuff and it's it's not. I mean, it, everything ebbs and flows or cycles and everything. And those that prosper long term learn to recognize the cycles and take advantage of them. <coughs> Excuse me. I mean, if nothing else, if you don't want to be a pessimist or you don't want to be viewed as one of those that takes advantage of the downside, which I know some people, for some reason, they have some moral compass that tells them it's not okay to make money. I, it, I can't even fit it. I mean, I just don't. I can't comprehend it. I can't comprehend having this idea in my mind that okay, the market's going down anyway. I know how to take advantage of it. I might as well prosper and make take advantage of it. So why wouldn't I? But some people say, oh, I don't want to take advantage of people suffering. Well, not my. They're going to suffer anyway. I know maybe that sounds bad, but in reality, they're not going to suffer if I go make a bunch of money. There will be at least maybe some people that will suffer less. And I have found a rabbit hole that is – somebody just threw some dirt in front of me. Um, <laughs> uh, it's just – I just can't comprehend the mindset. I just don't understand why you wouldn't want to take advantage of something like this if it's if it's going to happen anyway. It just blows my mind. I just can't figure it out. But that's the way some people think. So if you do nothing more than just get out of the way and wait for an opportunity to buy, you know, that's what some people do. Some people only want to trade bullish. Well, fine. Okay, then wait for this thing, as you can see. Wait for it to drop down to 1550 because that's the next – I mean, there's really no stopping point, right? There's not much here. There's a few minor – support resistance areas right here between 15, 15, 18, 67, and that's one reason I'm not freaking out about today. Yeah, it's down 50 points, and I wish I was on this, but at the same time, <clears throat> there's still about almost 300 points of potential from where it's breaking right now to where it's been, and the reality is that the odds are that it's going to bounce back up And probably use that 1867 area as resistance. I mean, take look back here, and I'll draw a line there so you can all see it. What happened right here? I mean, you look at just that one area. And here's the peak of 0708. We've got a beautiful head and shoulders there. It breaks down, basically broke the neckline. But even if we put the line there, which you could consider that the neckline, look at what it did. It broke. And this is a weekly chart, so keep that in mind. Here we've got three weeks. We take these three right here. It's okay, there's three weeks where it just crashed. I mean, 1475 to 1325. What is that, 150 points? That's about a 10% drop. And then what happened over the next two or three months is it danced around, danced around, then bounced back up and hit the old resistance level. And that's where it tanked. So that type of this is this is normal type of behavior for the market. So that is that is what I am expecting to have happen here because these types of and you can look at this entire chart and this goes back to ninety nine. So we're looking at sixteen to seventeen years of data, and you look at the drops that we've had, and you go back to any of these crashes, you go to this one. I mean, this one right here, you look at any big significant drops, and it doesn't go forever. I mean, you've got this one, this one. I mean, here's the biggest one, which was the housing crisis, which is when things, I mean, basically were 
literally the whole economy was about ready to, to go under. But every single one of those bounces at one point. And we've got a similar type of drop right here. And do we have something going on like the housing crisis? Mm, not that we know of, at least, right? But we've had these big drops before, and it almost always bounces back. So I am going to, and the hard part about it, like I've said, and I'll repeat it because I think it's important, is that the hard part is hanging on right now and waiting for it to bounce back to the upside, especially if it drops more. If it drops another 50 points tomorrow, then you're just sitting there going, ah, and you're freaking out. But the further it drops from where it is, the odds are the more violent the bounce will be. And part of the reason for that is this. For those of you that are familiar with shorting, if you're not familiar with shorting, I mean, you're basically selling a stock you don't own. <laughs> and so eventually, though, when you short a stock, you have to buy it back. You have to, you have to basically, without going too deep, essentially you're borrowing it from somebody. I mean, the broker basically has it kind of, I can't remember what they call it, remember the term, but the broker essentially holds on to your stock. And they will loan it out, partly because they're making money off of it, right? They will loan it out to somebody that wants to short it. But then that person has to cover that short at some point. So if you sold it to begin with, what do you have to do to close it? You have to buy it. So if you borrow something from somebody, you have to eventually give it back. And let's just see, let's say your neighbor is going to be gone for the summer. And you go ask them, hey, could I borrow your lawnmower for the summer? Use it. Mine's broken or don't, whatever. Sure, no problem. Now you say, I got three months. I'm going to go sell that thing, and then I'll just replace it by the end of the year or by the time he gets back. So you go sell it for 200 bucks. You put 200 bucks in your pocket, right? It's not yours. You borrowed it. You have to replace it before he gets back at the end of the summer. You put 200 bucks cash in your pocket. And then, let's say you go, you got to go replace it because now he's two months have gone by and he's coming back from his summer vacation. And you've got to replace that mower and you go to the store and it's going to cost you 300 bucks to buy a new one to replace it. You only put 200 in your pocket. You took 300 out. And you lost 100 bucks, right? Now flip that over and say you sold it, put 200 bucks in your pocket, and you go to the store to buy a new one to replace it. And it's you know you can buy a new one for 100 bucks to replace it. You sold his for 200. You took 100 bucks out of your pocket to buy a new one to replace it. You still have 100 bucks in your pocket, right? He comes home, finds out that he has a new lawnmower. It's even better than what he had, and everybody's happy. That's shorty. Now, if you shorted this market, if you shorted a stock or anything, let's just use the market as an example. Let's say you shorted the market up around, let's just say 2,000. I mean, it dropped from 2075. Let's not even go to the peak. Let's say you got short this market when it crossed 2,000. It's now at 1826. That's 175 points. 175 points on 2,000 is, what, almost 10%? Let's just say it goes to 1,800, and let's just call it a 10% drop. You got a 200-point move, which the reality is when you short something, you have to use margin because you don't actually own anything. You're not paying for it. So let's just say you did 1,000 shares, and it's 2,000. So it's $2,000 out of pocket, but it's really only 1,000 because you're putting up, you're basically putting $1,000 on hold, and now you've just made 200 points. That's a 20% rate of return in, what, two weeks? For the average Joe, 20% in two or three weeks is enormous. For us, it's like, you know, when you trade options, 20% is like, <laughs> okay, so what, 20%? Who cares? I just did 50 in like three days last week. What's 20%? I'll do that in like a half a day. Right, we kind of do a tug and seek. It's like 20%. That's not, but for most people, 20% is enormous. And so what's going to happen? They start to look at this and go, man, that's falling a lot. I'm up 20%. I like it. What are they going to start to do? They're going to start to close their positions. They're going to start to take their profits. 
And if you borrowed something and you have to and you sold it and you have to buy it back to give it back, eventually those people are going to start taking profits and then what happens here? You got buying pressure. Because they have to buy it to close it. They start buying a whole bunch <clears throat> because they have tons of short positions. They just buy, 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 and it takes this. And that's why when you get big drops like this, the upswings can be extremely violent and extremely fast. Because once a few people start covering their shorts, others start to do it, and it's like this: everybody's running for the exit at once. It's really no different than what's happening right now. Everybody's running for the exits. The market's dropping, 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 and everybody's running for the door. And it will be the exact same thing coming the other way because the short-term traders that are short now are going to exit their positions. Alerts have been in Netflix. Oh, Netflix. Let's go see what's going on. See, it's, it's already bounced a little bit. <coughs> Excuse me. I swear, I keep thinking this cough has got to go away eventually. It is getting better. It just seems slower than normal. It's probably because I'm getting old. can't believe how old I'm getting. Oh, no. uh, you know, isn't this what we were talking about last week? Hold on here. Was it Netflix that was last week we were looking at? No, that was CMG, huh? I know a couple days after that, I was like, wow. <laughs> that was kind of crazy. Okay, so Netflix. You know what? This is a perfect example right here. If we look at the intraday chart, perfect example of what I was just talking about. You see, this is a 15-minute chart on Netflix. It gaps up a little bit this morning, 109. It sells off to 97. It's down 12 points. Now, if you got short this thing anywhere between 109 and 104, if you're a short-term trader, an intraday trader, if you got short anywhere in those five bucks that it dropped, and it drops down to 97, and you're a day trader, you get a 104 and it goes to 97 bucks, you have seven dollars. That's what about a six or six and a half percent move in. An hour, hour and a half. That's if you look at 104. If you got in at 104 and it drops seven, you got in 108, 109. It's even more. You're looking 10 percent. What are you going to do? They're probably going to take either some profit or all your profit, right? And that's you can see how it's bounced here in the last 45 minutes because it was so oversold, it was so sold off that this most likely the last half hour, 45 minutes is short covering. And you can see what it's doing right now as we speak. It rallied back up to about 104. And now it's kind of stalling out. And I would venture to guess that this thing will probably kind of dance around here and go sideways for a little bit. I'd say for the next half hour to hour, the next four to five bars, it will probably just go kind of sideways here. And then it will either continue to fall or it may blast off to the upside. I would say it's probably going to continue to fall. It's probably going to defend. Oh, really? Oh, I just noticed that. Uh... Oh, okay. I didn't see that. Oh, there it is right there. I should see that. I know it's earnings season, too. I know. Some people say, how do you not know that? I'm not trading Netflix, so it doesn't matter to me. I don't. I no longer focus on things that don't matter. If I'm not going to trade it, I don't care about it. If they're coming out with earnings, who cares? If it's not on my radar and I'm not watching it, it doesn't matter. Okay, so that ex that explains the volatility then and the, the giant jump in volume. It's not just a normal deal, even though the market is – I mean, it wouldn't be a surprise because the, the volatility of the market is increasing, but – Oh, glad to know that was a practice trade. Did a practice naked put, sold to open a naked put with earnings. It was up considerably this morning. 
Yes, you would have been profitable first thing this morning, huh? And hopefully, I'm guessing you did that for the volatility. If there's enough volatility before earnings, which can be effective, is um, and that's the thing with Netflix and a lot of other these these big high flying companies that are very volatile. Um, right before earnings, they spike the volatility. It's why the chicken trade isn't as effective as it used to be. That's why we don't even talk about it or do it anymore because it used to be that the volatility, you know, they didn't spike it. The market makers figured it out that, you know, you can buy a put out of the money and a call out of the money and make a ton of money. But now, especially with the big guys, the Googles and the Netflix of the world, they spike the volatility so it makes it so expensive to buy options before earnings that it's really not that effective because they they put all kinds of fluff in there and then as soon as earnings comes out and it makes its move, they just suck it back out. Which I don't blame them. I mean, they're covering their risk. And with the gaps that are possible and that do happen and you get these types of move on earnings, they've got a lot of risk. So um, they've got to play both sides of the market and I mean, they're obligated to, right? They don't have a choice. So they're covering their risk by putting a bunch of extra time premium in it, and it was probably 06, 07 with Google when it was, I don't even remember what price it was at. And that's when I realized that the chicken trade was dead because it was, I remember looking at the options because I was thinking about doing it myself. Because everybody was talking about Google and earnings and it's going to, you know, chicken trade, chicken trade. And 100 points out of the money on both sides. In other words, it's I don't, like I said, I don't remember what the price was, but if it was at 200 bucks, the $300 calls and the $100 puts, to buy both of them, the net to get into that trade, to get into a chicken trade, 100 points out of the money was $5.40. And if I recall, the rule was you were supposed to try to get an option for about a buck on both sides and like two, three strikes out of the money. Here we are, eight to 10 strikes, 12 strikes out of the money, on both sides, not just one side, but both sides, and it's five dollars and forty cents, which is more than double of what you're supposed to do. I want that's just nuts. But you know what? I'm going to paper trade it just for fun to see what happens. The stock gapped. I think it was 95 points the next morning. I can't even remember if it was up or down. I remember it being almost 100 points and almost gapped to at the money. The option that was valuable, of course, one was worthless. The other one that had value. $3.40. $3.40. You would have paid $5.40 to get in. It had a huge gap, and you would have lost 2 bucks. When that happened, I just went, boop, check trade is dead. Or Google. I mean, it can still work. It's just not as effective as it used to be, especially on stocks like Google. So now, with the earnings thing, that this is, well, you know what? I still think it'll probably dance around sideways for three to five bars. And then go. With the earnings coming out, it's hard to say. I mean, this could be just a quick reaction. Um, it's a little a little different picture with that. It could be at least. Um, but I would still say that it, it's most likely to go sideways for a few bars and then sell off. The 20 day or the 20 bar moving average, I should say, the red line there, will continue to drop and it will probably catch up. And this will dance around until it catches up, or this might pop up there and hit it and then roll over. That's what would be typical. So, <laughs> where is, let's go look at this, because we looked at this last week. <laughs> and here is, who was that we were talking about? It. Somebody brought that up. But we're talking because we had that 25-point bounce on Chipotle, and I was just corrected last week because I always heard it pronounced Chipotle, and I never looked at it that close. And it's Chipotle. It's TL, not LT. I never even looked at it that close. I didn't care. It's not a big deal. <laughs> but I had somebody correct me. They're like, no, it's not Chipotle. It's Chipotle. Excuse me. <laughs> Didn't know it was a big deal. Then I'll just call it by its ticker symbol, CMG. I don't have to worry about it, right? Um, but yeah, we were talking about this, the big 25-point bounce. And I don't know if any of you caught that because I looked at it after the day or two after that. I was like, wow. 
you know, it was at 430 we were looking at it, it went to almost 480 so yeah it basically did hit almost 480 so it ran about 50 more points in what, two days two and a half days but here's this is another good example of uh, most likely I mean most likely those three days are short covering because if you if you shorted this thing up you know 650 700 bucks it's now at 400 you're making a killing we talked about this last week and really, when we get into situations like this where the trend is down and it's moving the way it's been moving, you look at the market, you look at just this particular stock, you're going to have these pops. And it's really not much different than trading the upside. It's exactly the same because when, when things are bullish, then taking a bearish trade on a super bullish stock should be short term, one to three days typically. Because the trend is the friend. The trend is going to continue most likely until something – Big enough happens to change it. And now we're in the same boat. We're in a downtrend. And so we're going to have the exact opposite types of movements where we're in a downtrend. And when the downtrend gets extended, it will probably retrace to the upside. When it gets oversold, just like when a stock gets overbought, it usually has a pullback. And now we're just flipping the picture over. I mean, we're clearly in a downtrend. We've broken a massive support level today, unless it somehow rallies back by the end of the day and leaves a big hammer there. So now pretty much every trade, we, we should be looking at the majority of our trades should be bearish trades. And then when it gets super oversold, like Chipotle did here, or Chipotle, gee, I did it again, see? It's a habit. When you have a period like this that goes from 560 to 400, 160 points, when you have that type of scenario, odds are it's going to bounce. And if you can take advantage of that, why not, right? So we're just looking for, you know, any bullish trade would be a short-term bounce, one to three days typically. Everything else, I mean, start trend trading the downside of this stuff. Amazon was another one we're looking at, and this thing is, uh, yeah, I mean, it's similar. We talked about this possibly doing what CMG did, and it's entirely possible. I think it's less likely with Amazon because it's not as susceptible to issues that CMG is. What was the other? Google was the other one, too, we were looking at, but, I mean, similar picture on both of them. Amazon and Google are very similar. But one thing to notice too, well, at least right now, of course, we're only a little more than two hours into the market, so I guess that is, we are going to have a big volume day. I was going to say the volume is drying up a little bit, but I don't think that's the case realistically. By the end of the day, it won't be. It could, though. I mean, if, if it decelerates and the volume doesn't accelerate, we get lower volume today. I mean, Amazon, there's a good example of Amazon. The volume as of right now has decelerated, even though realistically we're two and a half hours into the market, we're at about three quarters of what we had on uh, Tuesday volume there, which was an up day. So if we don't have significant volume today, if it slows down enough to where it's just the same as yesterday, or maybe a little tiny bit more, then the deceleration, the drop is slowing down. The momentum to the downside is slowing down a little bit. So those are really the clues I'm looking for is when the volume decelerates and the stock seems to be decelerating, then we have a couple of choices. We could either try to catch a bounce, or wait for it to bounce and then load up on puts. Because <laughs> we are, like I said, with the S&P, we are at a, a, a major point right here. Not at a major point. We've broken through a major point. I mean, the crash back in, you know, I think they called it a flash crash back in October of 14. Then the big drop here in August. They both dug in and got supported 1867. And the market tried to hold that. You notice the last couple of days, last couple of trading days, it's bounced off that level. And today is busting right through it. And so, get rid of those. There's nothing. When you go look at a weekly chart, there's there's almost nothing to hold this thing from going to 1550. 
And if you are bullish, I'll tell you this, when it gets to 1550, especially if it does it quickly, and this is the challenging part, and I think this is good because I know we talk here quite a bit about vision, right? So we're going to lay out a little bit of a vision of what is possibly to come in the market and try to come up with two or three different scenarios. If this thing just continues to tank day in and day out like it is right now, and it does it all the way to 1550, I can see a massive violent bounce at 1550. I don't expect that. I don't think that's likely we're going to have, or, or most likely, the odds are we're going to have some kind of bounce uh, between here and there, a decent sized one. But let's just say it did. Let's just say in two weeks' time we're at 1550, because we've dropped about 300, 250, 300 points in the last two, three weeks. Another 300 point drop in the next two or three weeks would put us about 1550. If that happens, what do you do? Because here's the hard part. If that happens, this VIX will be up here probably at 50, if not up at 80. The volatility will be probably at historical highs. Because that would be a crash we haven't seen since 08. About a pretty equivalent. I mean, we're talking, that was what, 1300? And it dropped to 873. So that's 100, let's call it 120, 425 points about a 25-30% drop in, how long did that take? Two months? So if we had a crash that size or bigger, the volatility would be so high, it would be so tempting to buy, to buy calls at 1550. But the problem with that is that the volatility would be so high that you're going to pay through the nose. It's kind of like, I think, when was it? It was in August. It was back here. It was on that day. Let me zoom way in here. Let's see if I can. It was, was it this day? Yes, it was. It was, throw an arrow. It was this day right here. Because it had fallen so far so fast, my mindset was that this thing is likely to bounce here. It's at the 1867 support area. It bounced off of it two days before that arrow day, that big day. The next day it sold off. It closed right there. I thought, okay, if it bounces a little bit tomorrow, I'm going to pick up some calls. Or you know what? That's not when it was because it was a gap down. It gapped down significantly. That's right. It gapped in the morning to the downside and then rallied. When was that? I think it was the one back in October. Gosh, time flies. I think it was this one, actually. Where, I don't remember, but I mean, the larger point is this. I think it was the, I'm pretty sure it was that day. Gosh, it seems like it was a bullish engulfing type of day, though. Maybe it was this one. Come on. There we go. I'm trying to make it clear which day it was. I don't remember if this was the day, but this will work for the example, because that's all it is, an example of what happened. But And this is what we have to be cautious of, is that the market already sold off big time. And it maybe doesn't look like it with this chart, but when you, you zoom out, you can see that it accelerated quickly to the downside. But we basically dropped 2100 to 1867. And it was down here at 1820. And I go look at picking up calls, and the spreads were like 4 and $5. It was a morning where it gapped down. This wasn't the right day. I'm trying to remember when, what day it was. Gosh, when was that? Because it gapped down like 25, 30 points. The S&P did. And because it had sold off so far and so fast and so hard, the expectation was that if it gaps in the morning, it's going to bounce and head higher. And sure enough, that's what it started to do. 
and the spreads, like I said, were four or five bucks. SSPY. Let's see, see on this way. There it is. It is there. there. Okay, that is it. It is the one in August. I thought it was more recent than that. Okay, it's just the the the, the SPX doesn't show the gap. The spiders did because it's an ETF. Okay, so this is it. Back at this this August, right? We sold off like this. I went. You know what? And everything was terrible. If it gaps the next morning, especially if it gaps down a lot. I'm going to buy some calls and open up, and the futures are just getting trashed. They're now like 60, 80. I mean, it was a record. It was almost a record. I think it may have been a record drop in the futures. And so I'm going, I'm going to pick up some calls because this thing is likely to bounce. I mean, it dropped from, well, what was the close was 195 and opened at 185. Yeah, it was a 10-point gap. So I go look at calls, especially when it gapped down 10 points and then it dropped another 8 or 10 points. We're down like 14, 18 points on the SPY. Like, whoa, I want some calls. Four or $5 spreads. You can't get in. And then what happened is it bounced. It came down to about 180, and it bounced up. I think it was about 190, 192. The calls I was looking at were 8 bucks by like 13 bucks. This thing bounced 14 points in like 45 minutes. And those calls, if I'd have paid 13 bucks for them, I could have sold them for like 10, 50, or 11 bucks. With a 12 or 14 point bounce, I would have only made, actually I would have still lost money because of the $5 spread and the fact that the volatility that got stuffed in there because of the spike in volatility got sucked back out once it rallied 14 points. So, the larger point is this, that if this thing does drop to 1550, if it, if it does that, which is not likely, but if it did, it would be almost impossible to even buy calls because the volatility is going to be spiked so much. Let's just say it drops to about 1750, which is very plausible. Very well could do that before it bounces. That's the next decent level of support. There's a little bit here, actually. Oh, we should throw that in make it a minor level because it's not that solid. Actually, it's more solid than the other, so we'll make it that. In fact, we're basically there, almost there now, 1811 or so. Let me move it up just a tad bit. Try to catch more of those tops. So 1815. Let's call it 1815. If we crash right through that and go to 1750, we'd be in the same scenario. Like, it'd be hard to buy calls because the volatility is going to be so spiked. It would be dramatic if it went to 1550, but even 1750, even right now, if you want to play the bounce, the volatility is high enough to where there's enough time premium. So this is where it takes a cautionary stance and a lot of discipline to sit and wait for this thing to bounce and let the volatility kind of settle in. Because the fear is that if it keeps running like this, you're going to lose out on a huge opportunity. And it's hard to sit and just watch it and go, because a lot of people are freaking out and panicking because I'm missing it, I'm missing it, I want to buy puts. Take a deep breath. You didn't miss anything. And let me show it again just so you realize that you didn't miss anything because if this thing's going to do what it's done the last two times, it's dropped big and crashed, we have another seven, 800 points to go. So it's okay. You haven't missed anything. <laughs> and that's the hard part to do is step back and look at the big picture and be realistic and say, okay, I'm not missing anything here. I haven't missed anything. Yeah, maybe you missed the initial move, but that's okay. Those are the hard ones to catch. Yeah, there can be a lot of money there in a short term, but if you're looking at the long-term bigger picture, there's more money in the longer-term downtrend than there is in this little quick burst. Just have patience, kick back, relax, take a deep breath. It's not the end of the world. Not yet, at least. I mean, if it drops to 1550, it might be, but <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, curious to see what the rest of the markets are doing. Same thing, obviously, but 
see, this is, I've been talking about this for a year. The transports and the Russell have been basically warning us that the economy is not that great. Because the Russell is a small caps, and the transports, if transports aren't doing well, that means products and goods aren't moving as much as they probably should be to sustain a good, solid economy. So if the transports are weak and the Russell is weak, those are some pretty big signs. And I've been talking about my insights for well over a year, since last, a year ago, August probably, so for 16 to 18 months. been looking at this market and saying, this is, I'm not sure what's going on. The rally is unsustainable, and it's likely to correct at some point. It may not be quick. It may not be this month or next month, but in the next few months, maybe a year or two, because reversals take some time, but here we are. Here we are, we're in the midst of a retracement, possibly the very beginning of a crash. But like I say, hope for the best, or prepare for the worst, hope for the best. Yeah, that's how it goes, however the saying goes. In other words, keep a positive attitude, but be prepared for a terrible scenario. Because we really are kind of on the edge. I mean, the our own government, our own federal government is leverage to the hilt. So any kind of hiccup, any kind of uh, anything that, that bumps this economy a little bit could knock it off the edge. It's like Humpty Dumpty. I don't know why he came to mind, but I mean, Humpty Dumpty, if you get knocked off, the, the shatters and everything's gone. <coughs> so just be prepared for that. And if it bounces and things get bullish and things look better and the economy actually does turn around and get better, it's just that much better. So uh, Brenda, question, would you buy in the money or out of the money options for a longer time? Um, sorry, I'm trying to keep this, I got this menthol in my mouth trying to keep from coughing. Um, wow. I don't know, and I would say that would be situational, but let's look and see. You know, let's just go look real quick and then we'll wrap up with this, so. Well, let's look at Amazon. That's a good one. It's pretty extended. We look at a long-term picture. Pretty extended. You can see how long it's been since I looked at trading Amazon. It was back at 300 bucks. It's more than doubled since then. But it's looking pretty bearish. You see the bands expanding. It's walking the lower bands. It is actually right now. Throw a few lines on there. Oh, really? I don't know why those jumped like that, but so there's what looks like the next two points for Amazon, maybe a tiny bit higher there, but so about 542. It's about there now, pretty close. Um, well, let's look and see. April is that far enough? Let's go out to July because April's only three and a half, four months away. That's scary. That's not good either. So if we go out to July, which is what, about six months or so? Because, yeah, we're on, yeah, we're, that's about six months of time. Yeah, I'm more curious than anything because I haven't looked at this. So let's say we think Amazon might go to 500. It's at 550. Well, if we look at, if you're buying longer term out of the money options, usually I like to buy options that are at the target. Because if you're buying out of the money, the most expensive time premium is at the money. So if you buy it when it's out of the money and the time premium is inexpensive, and then you sell it when it's at the money, the most expensive time premium you get, then you're getting most bang for your buck. So if you're looking at the 500s, which is 50 points away, which is really only a 10% drop. It's not huge for Amazon. They're basically 36 bucks. I mean, do we even need to look in the money? <laughs> you look at a delta of... Say 65, it's 115 dollars. That's just insanity. I don't care how much capital you have to work with. I would never pay that. 114. You buy one contract, it's 11,500 dollars. You buy 10 contracts, it's 115 grand. I mean, even if it drops, I mean, yeah, you buy 10 contracts, it drops 100 points, and you make 100 grand. Yeah, you almost double your money. Okay, but why not go down here and if you buy the 500s, you buy 
if you put the same amount of money, you're basically buying 40 contracts. If this goes to, if it doubles, which is, it would go to probably about 60 bucks. So 36 to 60, it's not quite a double, but close, but you got four times as many contracts. You're going to get more bang for your buck if you did that. <coughs> but let's just say you go want to go crazy and go way down to, say, 400. 11.65, probably 11 and a half, call it 11 and a half bucks. Um, but Amazon's got to drop 150 points in, within the next two to three months, which is entirely possible. But what if it bounces? What if it bounces up to, say, 650? That option is going to be cut probably in half. Well, let's see, is there, are there 300s? No, there's 330s. 330s are four bucks to sell. So if this thing bounces 60, 70 points, your option is going to be worth three, three and a half to four bucks. So um, Amazon's maybe not a great example, but realistically, um, depends on the time frame, and it would depend on the, the the biggest thing is the volatility. And right now, that's the challenging part. Um, if you're, I guess it depends on which question, I, and I should ask for clarification, are we looking at calls or puts? If you're looking for the short-term bounce on calls, I would buy short-term in the money and be very cautious because the volatility is spiked enough to where if it bounces, and especially if it bounces violently, then they're going to suck the time premium they've stuffed in it. The volatility is high enough, they're going to put, even in the money options, they're going to um, add some extra time premium to it's just the way the model works. It's just simple math. And then if the volatility drops off, they're going to suck that back out. So you could be in a situation just like I was with the spiders where, yeah, the options are – there's a 4 or $5 spread, and even on a, a big bounce, you still would have lost money. So you've got to be cautious. But on a short-term bullish bounce, I'd be buying in the money. I'd probably get closer to a 90 delta actually, which I rarely do. I usually like 65 to 70. But if you're looking at longer-term bearish positions, if that's the question, especially if you're going longer term, I'm always going out of the money. I don't buy long-term in the money options. They're too expensive, and there's no sense. When you get a better bang for your buck, you get a better rate of return with out-of-the-money options, whether it's long-term or short-term. The hard part is out-of-the-money options on a short-term basis are extremely risky because they're out-of-the-money and they're short-term. If you have longer term, if you have you know two or three months for this thing to drop 100 points, then that's different. So, yeah, if, if you're looking at bearish puts on the spiders, because I'm considering that too. I've been, I've been I kind of wish I would have back in the you know the 2,000 point range, uh, but woulda, coulda, shoulda. Uh, at the same time, it's I don't very often buy long term options. Because I usually I stay in cash unless I'm in something short term that's you know a week or too long. But go back to extreme charts. For the question, if you're looking at long term puts on the spiders, my opinion. Well, let's see what. There we go. I'm waiting for this market to bounce before I get into anything bearish. Unless there's a unless there's a stock. If there's an individual stock that um, has a good setup, that's different. But even then, because the volatility has spiked and it's been dropping so much, as hard as it is, if this thing continues to fall, will I sit and grit my teeth and be like, I wish I was in? Or I wish I was completely loaded up? Yes. But will I have the discipline to sit back and wait for it to bounce and get to a point where I want it to be or give me some other indication that we're going to continue lower without a bounce? Because right now the odds are it's going to bounce. It's just a probability thing. And so now it's where I have to work hard to stay disciplined and say, this is not my time to enter for my trading style. So I'm going to wait for it to bounce. Even if it may drop some more and I may have to grit my teeth and bear it, I'm going to wait for that to happen and be patient. And it might be later this week. It might not be till next week. <laughs> so, um, yeah, sorry. I'll admit but yeah, I will. Um, I will see if things if things bounce in the next day or two, or by the end of the week, then I'll be looking at loading up. So, yeah, 
Yeah, I know it's tough too, isn't it? <laughs> Brendan says, yeah, I'm sitting on the sides of paper trading only too. So it's uh, it's tough to do though, isn't it? But you know what's awesome about hearing that, Brenda? It shows that you have the discipline to do what you should do and stick to your plan and your style even though you may be tempted to get in. Even though the emotions are there and you're thinking you want to get there, you've developed the discipline and the foresight to see that maybe now is not the best time. And that's awesome. I love seeing that because um, it is hard. It's very difficult. It takes a tremendous amount of discipline to sell on sites because I didn't used to have that kind of discipline. And I'm living proof that it can be done. It can be. It can be learned. You can train yourself to have the kind of discipline necessary. And it is hard. It's difficult, but it's possible. So, with that, let me wrap up. And y'all, I think y'all know this, right? So, my marketing insights. There's the last little water. Good timing. So the market insights, if you want my commentary two, three days a week as to what I see in the markets, and I always start off with a little motivational quote, which I, I debated dumbing that, but I've gotten so much feedback, positive feedback, people say they love it that I keep doing it. And I keep finding new ones too, which is um, is good. But uh, basically it's just an audio video. It's recorded. I post it up. Uh, to the website, to your My Accounts page when you're a subscriber, so you can go watch it whenever you want. Seven ninety-five a quarter is the web shop price. And then the other two tools I have are Patterns of Flash, which is all technical analysis based. It's about six and a half hours of video. There's flashcards where you train your eyes to recognize the patterns, and then there's quizzes, which helps you uh, basically get feedback about what you learned and didn't learn inside the the videos, which is all foundational technical analysis along with some very advanced material as well. So. Uh, and then advanced trading mindset is all mindset. It's all about um, not only the the challenges that we bring to the table mentally, the the programming that we have, the way that we are raised to think and see things, and how those are used improperly with respect to trading. Because we all have that programming, right? We believe certain things, we see the world certain ways, we see things the way. We think they're supposed to be the way they are, and we bring that mentality, which might work in the real world, the normal world, if you will, but we bring those lessons that we learned and try to apply them to the market the way that we do out here, and it doesn't work. Like quitting. I mean, I was raised. You don't quit. You don't give up. And we bring that mentality into the market, which is a great attitude. It's a great mindset, but when you apply it to one individual trade, you say, okay, I'm underwater, I know, but I can't quit because I was raised not to quit. I don't quit. When you apply that to one individual trade, it is absolutely catastrophic. Most of us, as human beings, want to be right. We have a deep need to prove ourselves. We have a deep need to prove that we're right. And when you bring that mentality into the market and you try to prove the market, you try to control the market and tell the market that I'm going to be right and you're going to prove me right, it doesn't care. And so that mentality doesn't work. We have all these fears in life, in normal life. And we bring those fears into the market. And if we don't recognize them and learn how to adapt and deal with those fears, then you never get to where you want to go. It's like right now, the fear of missing out. We do that in normal life, right? Everybody wants what they can't have. Or you, you know, if you think you're going to miss something, and, and people in sales use it all the time because it's like this is the last one. It's called creating urgency, right? It's the last one we have. And if you want it, you know that guy wants it over there too. But if you want it, you better get it now. And it's like, oh, oh I don't want to miss it. And so we make decisions. We do things based on emotion of I might miss it. And we're in that time right now. The market is tanking. And for those of us that know how to play the downside, you're like, I'm, I'm missing it. I'm missing it. And you're freaking out. And this fear kicks in. But the reality is you've got to learn to manage that fear and learn to control that fear. And it's awesome to see that, that Brenda's there, and it's killer, Brenda. I love to hear that. Love to hear that. Uh, I know how hard you've worked. So it's just awesome. But that's what advanced trading mindset is, the six and a half hours of video all about 
the challenges we bring and how to solve them. And as you see, the pricing, those are two separate tools. You can get them each individually or both of them at the same time. They're $229 a quarter, but then if you renew them, it's just $99 per quarter. So once you've gotten them, subsequent quarters after that to keep it active is just $99. Bucks. And then if you want all three, if you get all three as a package, it's just $995. So you can get the insights, the patterns of flash, and advanced trading mindset all for just $995 bucks a quarter. So. Yeah, I love it. Right, there's always another train coming to the station. Exactly. And the one that just took off that you thought you missed is probably going to back up a little bit anyway. And so if it backs up a little bit, you can still catch it, right? Hopefully that made sense. So anyway, appreciate y'all hanging out. Uh, apologize for a little delay first thing, but uh, we got it done anyway. And... Uh, Considering the delay, we're not terribly late. <laughs> so you'll have a great rest of your week, and uh, we'll see you very soon. Take care. Bye-bye.